So Luke chapter 15, and we're going to begin at verse 11. And he said, this is Jesus, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And we had spent all, and arose a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants are in my father's house have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Just make me one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. The son said unto the father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field and as he came drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and his father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him home safe and sound. And he was angry. He would not go in. Therefore came the father out and entreated him. He answered, said to him, his father, rather, Lo, these many years I do serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, you have killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. Your word that is a lamp unto our feet, it is a light unto our path. And Lord, it illuminates our thoughts. Lord, it gives us a better revelation of the truth of who you are. And now, Lord, I just pray that you would superintend our minds. Give us the exact words to say. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the churches. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name. And everyone said, Amen. In the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 10. The prophet asked the question, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? In Romans 3.29, Paul asks a similar question. Is he the God of the Jews only, or is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. You see, our text generally emphasizes two sons, the two who were very unlike their father. Notice that. Neither one of them sons were like their dad. The one was younger and he wanted to go out and as it were sow his wild oats and, and live this wild life because he had been under constraint. He was tired of being under his father's watchful eye. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? Any of you ever had any kids like that? They decided when they moved out they weren't just going to move across town, they were going to move maybe across state or maybe out of state because they wanted to get as far away from the watchful eye of their parents as they could. And that's what happened with this young man. There was another brother within the house as well who was also very unlike his father. You see, he was filled with pride. He has this attitude that basically said, I've never done anything wrong, Dad. I've kept all of your commandments. How many believe that? 
Mm -hmm. It's not what the scripture said. They have all turned aside. They have all become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. This is God's indictment upon man. But see, he had this view of himself that he was much better than his younger brother. He had achieved some status within the family in terms of righteousness that he thought he was better than his brother. But what he didn't recognize was of the seven things God hates, number one is a proud look. So as far as the father is concerned, this older brother who thinks that he's just done everything right, and he's worthy and all of that, he stinks with pride more so even possibly than his brother. Secondly, the older brother did not have familial type love, a family type love. How many of you know something's wrong when your brother leaves the house and you're upset when he comes home? He had a bad spirit. I've always said, and I believe it's true, I've heard other pastors say it, I will never pet a bad spirit. We should never pet a bad spirit, saints. He had a bad spirit. Here comes his brother home. He's been received safe and sound. And rather than celebrating, he gets angry at the fact. This attitude highlights the fact that though he had never left home, he was very different from his father and he needed to be changed. And I asked myself this question this morning, what was God going to have to do in that person's life to get them changed the way they needed to be changed? Because we know what happened to the younger son, right? We know what happened to him to get his heart right. We know what happened to him so that he could come to himself. But what was going to have to happen in the life of this older brother who was high and mighty and didn't even have a love for his own brother? I suggest to you something really bad was going to happen to get a hold of this man because he had a loving father. And a loving father, saints, does what it takes to get their sons and daughters into line. You see, love is not the love that we think of today. God's love is a love that says, I want them to be in my kingdom. I want to spend eternity with them. I want them to be changed in, in my image and what I am like. And I am willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. How many of you ever had a parent that when the belt didn't work, they got the switch out? Listen, the scripture says, that no chastening for the present, talking about whenever we're chastened, seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who have been exercised therewith. Furthermore, we had fathers on our earth that chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. You know, sometimes parents might get upset because you embarrassed them at the store. And when you get home, you're in trouble. It wasn't a spanking so much because you needed it because you needed to get your life in order because your behavior is bad and I love you and I want to make sure that you, you're doing the right things. You're, there's something about the, you that needs to be changed. And I have no other recourse but to use this paddle on you. That's the way it ought to be. But oftentimes it's not that at all, is it? It's, well, I'll teach you. And it's often done out of anger. And this is why we do not understand God's discipline. Because he does not discipline you out of anger. He disciplines you for your profit. That you might be partakers of his holiness. He always has in mind, saints, what is best for us. He always has thoughts of peace towards you. Of goodness. Of hope and a future and an expected end. Jeremiah 29. I preached about this just a few weeks ago. Did you know that the context of those verses is that God had allowed Israel to be destroyed. They were going to be carried away beyond Babylon. They were going to be there 70 years. And it was almost as though there was going to be a yoke around their neck during this time. As a matter of fact, one of the kings was drawn to Babylon with hooks. But it's almost like God wrote a note to send with them. So they didn't get the wrong idea. And he said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, of good and not evil, of a hope and a future. It's almost like he was saying, don't get the wrong idea about what I'm allowing into your life. Because I love you 
and I have to do this because if I don't, you're not going to change. I've tried everything else. I tried to get your attention with the prophets who were eating dung cakes. I tried to get your attention with calamity, with famine and every other thing under the sun and you wouldn't listen. So here we are. And because I love you and don't want to lose you, I have to allow this to come. I have to send it. But it isn't because I don't love you. Because that's the way the devil tries to spin everything, saints. He tries to spin everything so you blame God. You get upset. You don't see it properly. But understand that no matter what we go through in our life, no matter what God is allowing, He is doing it for our profit. That we might be partakers of His holiness. It's not just accidental. I like what Brother Josh Pennington, he said, God is never doing things idle. When he's not doing something, he's doing something. But something, saints, that God has showed me, and I just pray that he will give you this revelation to you as well, is that God is a loving God. But his love is not the type of love we're used to talking about. His love is the type of love that will do whatever it takes to accomplish the end. He's looking at you with love, a burning love that says, I want what's best for you. I want you to be in my kingdom. And in the case of this prodigal son, he financed his rebellion. Now, I wouldn't have done that, but I guess that's because I'm not loving enough. We're always trying to do something to keep our kids from learning lessons they need to learn, sometimes the hard way. I was bad about that as a dad. I thought I was being loving by protecting them from getting hurt. Oh, don't get hurt. Oh, just sit down. Just be still. But guess what it does? It stunts their growth. And it takes them many years to learn things they could have learned as a child. But see, we think we are doing the loving thing, but we're not. Notice what he did. The son came to him and said, Father, give me what's coming to me. I have an inheritance coming. Father didn't say, no, you can't have it. He just simply said, here it is. And what did he do? We know the story. He took it out. He went out into a far country, out from under again his father's watchful eye because he was just tired of having that on his conscience. He wanted to get somewhere where he could just really let his hair down, as it were. And he spent every penny of that money. Saints, did you know that God knows how many resources he has entrusted us with? And he knows when they are going to run out no matter what it is. At some point, he knows when that's going to be. And this is true in a lot of people's lives. They don't realize that it is God's goodness that is designed. This is what Paul said in Romans. It is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. If you wake up in the morning and you have breath in your lungs, it's the goodness of God, saints. If you wake up and you've got food on your table, it's the goodness of God. If you have a roof over your head, it's the goodness of God. And all of this is intended to draw you closer to the Lord, to bring you to a place of repentance. We were just singing this song, to make you more like Jesus. That's God's design. He's working in my life to make me more like Jesus. And sometimes that means you've got to go through some hard things. Because there are things about me that need to change and there's no other way to do it. Have you ever heard preaching like this? This is truth. There are things about us saints that often we don't even know. Behaviors that we exhibit, we've been doing it so long that we're so used to doing it, we don't even know we're doing it. That's right. And God said, I can't tolerate that. Not because he's mad, but because he wants you to be like his son. And he's done everything in his power to get you to change. And you will not. So he has to turn it up to something greater and greater. He doesn't want to, but he doesn't have a choice. C.S. Lewis once said, the thing about the devil is that he enables people to look into the mirror and not see things about themselves that are perfectly obvious to anyone that's ever spent a significant amount of time with them. We are blind to our own problems, saints. We're so used to acting out until somebody points it out to us. You ever, you ever notice how you do this? You know that's offensive to people? Well, I don't know. I, and then they get offensive because you mentioned it. And that's why a lot of people keep doing it. Because people are afraid to offend. And that's the times we live in. So then God has to deal with it. And God will deal with things, saints. What ended up happening? Here's this young man. And he had spent it all. And all of his friends abandoned him. As we know the story. The scripture said, While in the pigsty, 
he came to himself. He came into his right mind. He began to think differently. It was like he had a paradigm shift. And that's what the first step to repentance is, saints. It is a change of mind that results in a change of action. A lot of times I get very concerned when I think about how I see certain things and I think, God, what are you going to have to do to correct that? Because I know you're not just going to let it go. And that's why the scripture says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If when someone is speaking or someone's ministering or testifying or anything, and, and maybe it's just coming out of nowhere, God begins to convict you about something or put something in your heart that, you know, I want you to change this area. Don't harden yourself against that. That's God trying to deal with you. He's trying to make you into the image of his son. And if that simple little dealing with you, if that still small voice doesn't get the job done, he can ratchet it up to a whirlwind if he needs to. He would rather speak to you in a still small voice. But if that doesn't get the job done, he has other ways of dealing with it. And one of the things I always tell people, and I tell my children this, when you go through things, always ask God, Lord, what are you trying to do in my life? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to teach me through this? It's almost like God is taking the tool and he is shaping us as we're turning on the wheel. He is shaping us and he has to take some rough edges off. Look at the older son. You know what his attitude was? I don't need any change. I'm good to go. No, he exhibited again the number one characteristic in a person that God hates. And that's a proud look. You see, without hesitation, the father gave the young son the money because he knew that the day would come that it would run out, he would come to himself, and that he would come home. Right now, saints, to a greater or lesser degree, God is doing the same thing. He's providing people with the things that they need because God is moving in this reality, his goodness trying to bring us to repentance. He's pouring out his blessing. He's pouring out his goodness. He's giving us, as it were, our inheritance. But what's going to happen, saints, when it runs out? Because it will eventually run out. And you look up and the gas isn't $5 a gallon, it's $10 a gallon. I'm being told that on the East Coast right now, they are already modifying the, the gas pumps to go to 10 and beyond. I say, wow. So what's happening? God's wanting a nation to come to itself. And he's turning the temperature up. How many of you have ever been up north or even in Silver Dollar City when they're heating up these horseshoes and they're hitting them and they've... Have you ever seen a bellows and they're using it to heat up the, God told Israel, I've been heating the fire up, trying to change you. And now I've burned up the bellows. Imagine the fire so hot, you caught the bellows of fire. But he said, but still you're not changed. You're still reprobate silver. God's going to turn the temperature up in the individual life. He's going to turn it up in the church. He's going to turn it up in this nation until we decide that we're going to hear what the Spirit is saying to us and we get on track, saints. That's because God is a loving God. He is a loving Father and He's not just going to let us continue down this road. The young brother comes out of the pigsty. He comes to himself. He is rehearsing going home. And notice what he said. He said, I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned. This is always the first step in repentance. You change your mind and then you confess or you acknowledge what God has said. What is his intention? That we would seek the Lord. His ultimate desire is that we would turn to him, saints, listen to me, while there is still hope because time is running out. Time is running out. And while we still have a chance, we can turn. He's filled our pockets just like the Father filled the Son. He's given this nation the things that it needs to do things, thinking that they can find satisfaction here or there with the hope that they will come to their right mind and turn back to the Lord. You see, a loving Father is willing to let people choose for themselves. He's not going to force his saints. He's not going to do it. 
He's going to let us choose for ourselves. He's, he would prefer to use his goodness he would prefer that we recognize him, and you see this in the book of Acts in two different places, but when that doesn't work, ultimately, he has to move. You see, God's love sets a limit on how long we can enjoy ourselves independent of him. He's only going to let us enjoy ourselves so long independent of him, and then he will move. But here's this young son. He's heading home to the father's house. The father didn't scold him. How many of you know he's a loving father? He didn't scold him. He's looking out the window. He's looking down the road. You know, a lot of people, because maybe their father was a lot different than the heavenly father, they have a misunderstanding of who our father in heaven is. But my understanding of what a father is comes from the word of God. Yeah. Comes from who God is. Yeah. And all the things that I learned as a child all the things I've seen happening, all the way I saw fathers reacting that had programmed my mind to think this is what a father is. God has had to systematically change over time. So I understand how he is as a loving father. He's a loving father. He's a compassionate father. And when everybody else gives up, if you're a godly father, you will keep pressing on for your children. He's looking out the window. He looks up, he sees his son coming, and he starts running down the road. I could almost see him. There he is. What a load left it off of his father's shoulders. My son, he's come home. He hears him rehearsing all these things. Scripture said that he fell on his neck and he began to kiss him. I looked that word up in the Greek. It meant he, he began kissing him repeatedly, over and over, kissing and kissing. That's God's attitude towards you. That's how he feels about you. Son started saying all this stuff. I've sinned against heaven. Give me the ring. <laughs> right? Hold up. Oh, wait a minute, Dad. I got something. No. Give me the clothes. No, I, I want to confess this to Kill the fatted calf. You see, he knew his son was changed. And he was not in the business of punishing him. Because the payment has already been paid. God doesn't punish us. Not like the law punishes us, like you need to get yours. No. What God does for us is with the design of changing us because he loves us. He's not there to abuse us. He doesn't take pleasure in these things. And you see that in the life of the prodigal son. Well, what happened? They throw a party just like in heaven. Bible said that the angels in heaven Rejoice over one who repents. Hmm? Imagine that. They begin to celebrate in heaven when there is repentance. But yet you have this older brother that is so hard for me to get past. But the only consolation that I have is knowing that God has a way to deal with him too. I don't know what it's going to be. My mind's always thinking something, you know, like the belt. But it may not be that. It may be a circumstance that breaks his heart and then he changes because the belt isn't always the answer. Matthew Henry once said, God is never at a means, a loss for a means of dealing with his children. He's not running out of options. He's probably sitting there thinking, well, what will I do this time? Well, I got 25 options here. I think I'll do this. And it may be very different than what we expect, but as long as it achieves the goal, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Even though his older son had a bad spirit, he still went out and entreated him. Even though he stunk with the worst smell that his father could tolerate, he still engaged him and talked to him. Why? Because he's a loving father. And that's his son. And he loves him. That's the kind of father I want to be. Father, we're so grateful for your example.